You can turn your Bibles now over to Philippians chapter 1. I'll be reading in a couple of moments, Philippians chapter 1, beginning in verse 19. But I want to begin with just asking one basic question today, and it's drawn from our text, or at least the, the core concern that I find in our text for us today. And that is this, is your conduct worthy of the gospel of Christ? Is your conduct worthy of the gospel of Christ? And I thought it might be beneficial to try and state it a couple of different ways. Is the way you live worthy of the death of Jesus Christ? Are you a living testimony of the grace of God? Is your life a manifestation that Christ died to save you? So the basic question for today is, is your conduct worthy of the gospel of Christ? Our text today is verses 27 through 30, but I'd like to begin reading in verse 19. So I ask you to stand with me now for the reading of God's word and for prayer. Philippians chapter 1, verse 19. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. But with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. And since we're memorizing, let's say it together. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose I cannot tell. For I am hard-pressed between the two having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, and note this please, beloved saints, for those of you who have lost loved ones, to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. In our passage for today. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation, and that from God. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. I'd like to ask Scott Miller if you'd pray at this time as we look at God's Word. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, name above all other names, mm. as you sovereignly have placed leaders in this country, in the world, and this world that you've given us dominion over, I pray for them, Lord. I pray that they would not seek their own selfish desires. They would not even seek the will of the people, but they would first seek you Amen. as they go about the business of giving glory to you by their leadership you have appointed them to. As we listen to the word, your precious word that you've given them for us to learn to live by, as we hear it administered today, I pray, Lord, that it would reach our ears uh, go through our mind, process our mind, live in our hearts, so that out of our hearts, our mouths would speak your glory, your living wisdom to all that we meet, and all those places that you've sovereignly placed us, whether it be here, out abroad in the world, or anywhere else, Lord. I just pray that these things would be manifested in us so that we would indeed be worthy of the gospel. <clears throat> worthy of walking worthy in the gospel that you've graciously given us. These things I pray in the precious blood, and in the, in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. You may be seated. According to verse 27, and we're trying to get a feel for where Paul is and the Philippians are at this particular point, Paul was absent. We know that he was in a Roman prison, and we know the reason is, is because he was brave enough in a time that was hostile to Christ to declare and to preach the gospel. And he was suffering for serving the Lord. By the way, this is the common thing um, throughout the generations and centuries to actually suffer for the cause of Christ. We have had it really easy um, in our nation for a long, long time, and I'm not sure that will always be the case, so prepare. The Philippians had witnessed this, according to verse 30. Look at verse 30 again. He says, having the same conflict which you saw in me 
and now here is in me. That word conflict there indicates that this is an intense struggle against strong opposition. And so Paul is suffering, the believers at Philippi are suffering, and they had witnessed what Paul had endured. We don't know all of it, but part of it's found in Acts 16. So let's go back to Acts 16. I know you began reading this, but in Acts chapter 16, we find out what was some of the things that they were exposed to that they saw Paul and Silas suffer for the cause of Christ. From Acts 16, you know that Paul is on a missionary trip. Um, He has made his way to Philippi. If you know how Paul typically proceeded when he got to a new community, he'd go to the synagogue. There's no synagogue, though, in Philippi, which indicates that there was less than 10 people who gathered God-fearers to worship God, so they went down to the river. And when he went down to the river, he met this lady by the name of Lydia. Um, It indicates that she was somewhat wealthy. She was a seller of purple. You also notice that she was a God-fearer. And the Lord worked, and she received the things that Paul said. And I'm going to use this word very specifically. She was converted to Christianity. And then she and her household were baptized. Later on in the chapter, you could read further, you'll find that there was also a jailer that was also saved by the grace of God, and his household was baptized as well. If you remember, he was about to take his own, end his own life. And Paul said, don't worry, we're all still here. You can read about that later. But right now we're going to break in to where the conflict was, the struggle in verse 16 here in Acts chapter 16, verse 16. Now it happened, as we went to prayer, that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us and brought her masters much profit by fortune-telling. So just capture that in your, in your mind. I envision her to be a young girl, a little girl, um, who has a spirit, a, a demonic force. She's able to tell fortunes. And there's this group that have taken her hostage and are using her for profit. And so this, this, so verse 17, the girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Now in context, I do believe this is the demon speaking through her. And I think you'll pick that up and as we read a little bit deeper here. And she did this for many days, but Paul greatly annoyed turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. Now, they didn't mention they messed up our profit, but that was really their deepest concern. But to add to their charges, they said, They teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they drew them into prison, threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. So they were engaged in the gospel and the gospel ministry, and this was a disruption to this ungodly community. It impacted their commerce. And they also said it impacted their worship. They were told to practice customs which were not lawful. Roman citizens were only to worship the Roman emperor. So this is the nature of why they were suffering. Now, I am certain that most of you here are culturally more current than I am. How many of you have heard of influencers? So apparently these are people who don't necessarily have a skill set, but they have a large following, and they tell people what to do, right? Well, what about disruptors? How many of you are familiar with disruptors, marketplace disruptors? I see a couple of you. This this group here, these people focus on a particular marketplace item, and their desire is to disrupt the way things have been done. They seek to change, to alter the conventional way of doing things. In our lifetime, we've had a lot of disruptions um, that could quickly come to mind. For instance, cell phones. Everybody here got a smartphone? That's a disruptor to the common way you used to communicate, and so are home computers. I mean, that's changed the way we study, the way we work, the way we do research. Could add to it a couple other ones that are rather innovative. Facial recognition and DNA testing. That changes how you look into your past and also how you investigate crimes. Here's some interesting ones that you might not think about. How about a bed in a box? In the day you went and found a mattress, now they just delivered in a box, right? Are air fryers. Can I get an amen on air fryers? <laughs> I don't know how to use them if someone give me a tutorial. Lots of other things that are web-based, Amazon, online banking, Airbnbs. 
All of these are disruptors. They disrupt the normal way that we do things, and there will be those who benefit. But you also have to keep in mind there will always be those who suffer loss, especially those who are doing it the conventional way and making a lot of money. And you can expect when it's disrupted, they're going to be upset. The gospel is a disruptor. The gospel should be a disruptor. When the gospel reaches an ungodly community, those who suffer loss not only of resources, but more importantly, lifestyle, selfish lifestyle options, you can expect them to be opposed to you. Let me give you a couple of ways that this could take place with the gospel if our conduct was worthy of the gospel of Christ. When we as Christians work towards ending abortion, you can expect there to be opposition. Now granted, there are those who are ignorant and proceed in this, but there are many who fully know that they're ending the life of a baby. And what's worse, there's, it's big business and lots of people who profit. And if you take a stand and seek to end it, there'll be opposition. And again, for anyone who has been associated with abortion in any way, praise the Lord for His grace. So don't take this as any word of condemnation. Just a reminder that this ought to be, the gospel should disrupt that particular profit making scheme. Let me add another one to it. When we as Christians don't engage in the false notion that there are many genders, you can expect that someone's going to come against you. And I just heard a report, I think it was last night, about a woman who was engaged in this. This is big money, the, all of this transgender stuff, and the, the, the economy of it is huge. The gospel should disrupt that. It should alter that. When you as a Christian are brave enough to share Jesus Christ in the workplace or in a club, and those who are maybe profiting through ungodly, unethical practices are disrupted by the gospel, you can expect someone to silence you, to cancel you, to try and put an end to your witnessing. Paul experienced the consequences of being faithful in gospel ministry. And as he wrote, so did the believers of Philippi. And you and I should be no exception to it. We should be engaged in, in Christ-centered witnessing and be prepared to be attacked. Now, I've taken some time to set what was going on in that particular day and try and bridge it to us today. But I want to remind us that in the midst of hostilities towards us as Christians, and ultimately it's hostility towards the Christ that we worship, we must have conduct that is worthy of the gospel of Christ. For those of you who like to take notes, the word conduct in this particular passage, embedded within it, is the word for citizen. And if you want to write down a cross-reference when we get there, chapter 3 and verse 20 tells us that we are citizens not of this earth, but we as Christians are citizens of heaven. And so therefore our conduct is to be befitting of where our citizen actually lies. So what is this conduct? What is the conduct that is worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ? I would dare say that most of you might already start thinking, and I was encouraged last night as we talked about it at our service last night, because I asked the question and people responded. Someone right away knew that ultimately it had something to do with the way that we think. That our minds have to be transformed and renewed day in and day out by the grace of God. And this is in keeping with where we're going to go in Philippians chapter 2. Have this mind which was also in Christ Jesus. And what we're going to see in Philippians chapter 2 is that we're going to need humility, to be obedient to our Heavenly Father. We're going to need courage to suffer for eternal purposes. We're going to need determination to put the needs of others above and before our own needs. We're going to need wisdom to fulfill the role that God has called us. We're going to need to be faithful to glorify our Lord and Savior in all things. Now there's more that we'll add to this. Characteristics like gentleness, kindness, joy, generosity, and definitely patience. But ultimately, it's a different way of thinking and then a different way of living. Go over to Philippians chapter 4. I do want us to get just a taste of what Paul will have for us in our study ahead. Philippians chapter 4. And notice what he says here. Philippians chapter 4. I'll break in in verse 4. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, Rejoice. If I just stop for just a moment. I think it's in the midst of sometimes the harshest things that we experience that we need to be reminded that God has commanded us to be joyful and to rejoice. I was reminded of this yesterday talking with someone who suffered, I think, for like 15 years now, daily pain, even at night in pain. 
And yet within this individual, there's a heart to still rejoice in the Lord and to honor Him. Um, this is a testimony to others, for those who have the courage to rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness known, be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Here's something we've got to hear. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, even in the midst of pain and hardship, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Go a little bit further. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And notice once again the peace of God in play. The things which you've learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. It's what we need, isn't it? Is peace. I do believe that's probably one of the deepest longings of people, is peace. And they'll look almost anywhere for it, but it can only be found in Christ. Now, we'll see this as we work our way through this study of Philippians, but I want to return back to our context, our context right now. So go back to chapter 1. I want to draw your attention to two particular elements that are part of this conduct, which is worthy of the gospel of Christ. And I find these two particular things to be kind of interesting because I think they are the result of godly conduct, and yet they're part of godly conduct. So as we're pursuing Christ, these things will become evident, and then they become part of it. The first one being unity. Notice verse 27, 27 again. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, here it is, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Now, there's a couple of allusions that Paul has here as he writes, the allusion of warfare and preparation either as a soldier or an athlete. The first word, stand, is normally used in reference to a warrior holding his position on the battlefield. So, godly conduct means that when we are facing opposition, especially from the evil one, we are able to stand and stand firm. But notice the word striving also. This is used of the discipline, either in preparation for battle or for athletic competition, that you are disciplined in the process to be able to stand strong. Paul wanted his readers, which would include you and me, to know that unity within the body requires work. We have to prepare together in order to resist the hostilities that will oppose us. You'll also notice that what is at stake is nothing less than the truth itself. When he says here the faith of the gospel, I think he's talking about the deposit of truth that is known as the faith of the gospel. The gospel message, what is the deposit of truth? What are those elements? Let me put it to you this way. If you were to share the gospel on an elevator with somebody, what would be the statements that you would make rapidly for someone to hear the simplicity of the gospel? I would hope that everyone would begin with something like, either God is holy or we are not. We are sinners in need of a Savior. And then add to that some sort of a statement that Christ alone is that Savior. He's the one who died to pay for our sins and rose that we might be justified. And then hopefully you would add to it some necessary response, namely to repent of sin and to trust in Jesus Christ. This particular deposit of truth is, is to be guarded by the unity of the saints. We are to be disciplined, prepared for the opposition, and it requires nothing less than unity. We simply do not have time we don't have the energy. We don't have the opposite option of being at odds with one another. We have got to be a people united because the gospel that unites us is also the, the gospel that keeps us united for our labor against opposition. Now, thankfully, we don't depend upon ourselves or our own strength, but upon the God who saved us to be united. The phrase, stand fast in one spirit. I would like to capitalize the word spirit there as I study Paul in this particular book, I think he's speaking here about the Spirit, the blessing that we have, that the Spirit is the one and only Spirit who unites us. And so we're able to sing, He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. And it's the Spirit that breaks the pride of division and unites us. But let's go on now to confidence in verse 28. I believe also this is an element of godly living, of conduct worthy of the gospel, verse 28. 
and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation and that from God. When facing opposition, there are many different ways people will respond. There are some who will simply run and hide, go and dig a hole as deep as they can. There are others who will get strong and arrogantly retaliate against the opposition. There are some who will try and appease, blend in with just a little bit of ungodly living, try and fly underneath the radar. As Christians, we should be confident in the Lord. Not afraid, not terrified, not seeking vengeance, nor retaliating, but as the Bible says, wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We're not going to go out and seek problems. We're going to not try and start a fight. But we have to know, led by the Spirit, when to speak and when to be silent, when to share the good news that Jesus saves, and be ready for the opposition that we'll face and even the suffering that we'll endure. And it will be our conduct worthy of the gospel of Christ, which if you notice in this passage, will be a sign to believers and even to ourselves. To unbelievers, the sign of our godly conduct will actually be a sign to them of perdition that they're lost. Believe it or not, when we live for Christ, if God's at work, if the Spirit's at work, other individuals will go, I don't know what's going on here. I don't have that peace. I don't know this Christ that you speak about. But for those of us who are saved, it'll be a reminder to us that, yes, we've been saved by the grace of God alone. Because I wouldn't live this way if it were left up to me. Now let me make a couple of comments. Let's stop for just a moment. Number one, in light of what I just said, you will not be confident if you are not daily walking humbly with your God, denying yourself and taking up your cross. It is a daily endeavor. If you lack godly conduct worthy of the gospel of Christ, it's probably because you're not engaged in the foundation of a life of devotion, seeking the Lord early in the morning, throughout the day, and as you end the day. There's no substitute for the basic disciplines of being in the Word and being in prayer. Can I get an amen on that? Someone mentioned to me this last week, actually several individuals mentioned something about this. They said, I've never been part of a church that puts so much emphasis on memorizing Scripture. And they were thankful for this. This wasn't something they were saying, I don't like this. They were very thankful for this. My challenge to the men on Tuesday morning, the older men that we call ourselves silver saints, that's a good representation, um, is to memorize at least one to five life verses and have those tucked away so that as the body fades and the mind diminishes, that your mind might be stayed upon the Lord. And I, I drew this from an example of an older man that did this. Um, and I thought it was a, a, I think it's a great way to think about passing even through the valley of the shadow of death, that your mind would be stayed upon the Lord. The psalmist declares, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. We need his word. If you are not seeking the Lord, I know we're past January 1st, but maybe this would be a good New Year's resolution on January, what is today? The 8th, on January 8th, let's make this our resolution to seek the Lord. To seek the Lord. Go to, to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. The contrast that's laid out in Luke chapter 12, I think, is, is significant for us in Luke chapter 12 and the call to seek the Lord that's in that passage. Luke chapter 12, I'm at verse 22. And he said to his disciples, Luke 12, 22, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life and what you will eat, nor about the body, what you will put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. And I, I have to tell you right now, I'm feeling with inflation, I need to hear this passage. I used to think going out to eat was a treat. Now I think going to the grocery store is a treat. Can we really buy food today? Can we really have some of that? Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? in which you view by worrying can add one cubic to his stature. If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. And here's what we're called to do. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Can we get an amen on that? If you're not seeking the Lord, then seek Him. The other thing I want to say is this. There should be unity 
amongst the brethren in the body of Christ with or without opposition. Now, I think it's true, and definitely there are some people that really need some opposition. They almost need an enemy, an adversary, in order to be productive. And one of the things that I find the saddest, though, is that when people are not united, unless they have a common enemy, they fight and bicker amongst themselves, but give them a common enemy, and then suddenly they're united. Let us only look to what is unseen to recognize that we have an adversary, the evil one, and that is sufficient. Let's not view anyone that we see as ultimately the problem. Let's recognize that there are opportunities for us to share the love of Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that not only unites us initially in salvation, but helps us as we are sanctified day by day. Now, as we do this, as we are engaged in gospel ministry, we shouldn't be surprised that we will suffer. But what's interesting in this passage is this is part of the gracious gifts that God gives to us to suffer for Christ in the gospel. Look at verse 29 back in chapter 1 again of Philippians. Philippians 1 and verse 29. Here's what he says, For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, number one, not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake. Now I know that there would be many who are surprised by the first part of the verse, namely that faith is actually a gift from God. Not everybody has faith. Not everyone is believing. And the writer of Hebrews seems to indicate this as well and says, without faith it's impossible to please God. If everybody had faith, everybody would be pleasing to God. But this is a gift from God. But the second part, let's be honest, is a bit unsettling. That God would grant to us to suffer for Christ. That this is a gracious gift from God. Now, we're going to look deeper into this as we go into this book. But let me just make a few comments about suffering if you're building out your theology on suffering. First one I want to say is this, is suffering is not enjoyable. Can I get an amen on that? There's no sense in walking around when you are struggling to say, it's fine, I'm fine, everything is fine. We are believers, the Lord knows what's going on, and it is good for us to share with one another. This is hard. This is painful. And be okay with that. That might be what God uses just to flush part of it out so that you again find that peace of God. And by the way, thank you all for reaching out to one another. I heard a story again this last week of somebody who reached out to someone in our church just at the right time. It was a blessing to them. It's not enjoyable. Let's, let's understand that it isn't. It's okay to do that. Number two, let us also understand that suffering is ordained by God. It's ordained by God, and I know that's a big word, um, it would not happen, though, if He did not permit it. And ultimately, we have no need to defend God. If it occurs, it is part of His perfect will. And so we should acknowledge that suffering is what God has ordained. Number three, realize that suffering is a testimony to the lost and to the redeemed. How you suffer, if you suffer well, is a huge witness to unbelievers. Because they'll wonder how you're doing it and how you're getting through it. And you can tell them, apart from Christ, I wouldn't. But for fellow believers, if you suffer well, realize that the comfort that God grants to you is a comfort that you can give to others. So this, too, is a gift from God as a testimony to the lost. Finally, let us recognize that suffering is part of God's means to conform us more and more to the image of Christ. Suffering God uses to conform us. Why? Because in the midst of our suffering, we once again realize we are not sufficient in and of ourselves. And we turn to God and say, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Don't waste your suffering. God has entrusted it to you for the benefit of others and for yourself, ultimately for your good and definitely for his own glory. Both believing and suffering are gifts from the Lord. So let's just add a few ways that that could be applied. If you are not included in something because you are living for the Lord and you're suffering because you didn't get included, You've lost nothing. I remember we used to tell our children, the Lord might be protecting you from something that you don't need to be part of. So if you're not included because you're living for Christ, that suffering is not that big of a deal. If you are dismissed or rejected because you honor the Lord, then you draw near to Him. And you know of His comfort and His presence and His power. And if you're attacked for your beliefs, then fear not, for what can man do to you? I remember years ago asking a friend of mine out in Virginia, what's the worst thing that God, someone could do to you? And he said, I guess they could end my life. And then our response would be to live as Christ 
to die as gain. Now, I want to go back to our passage in verse 27 by way of conclusion. I want to note one more thing in verse 27, and that is accountability in this passage. And in the context here, I find this to be important as it touches on church leadership in verse 27. He says, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs. Now, I understand Paul was an apostle, but I sense here a degree of a pastoral heart, that role of an elder who watches over the souls of individuals. Uh, do you remember the little book towards the end of the New Testament of Philemon? Uh, do you remember Paul was dealing with a runaway slave by the name of Onesimus, and he sent him back to his master Philemon? He said, Philemon, I want you to receive him back no, no longer just as a slave, but now as a brother in Christ. Do you remember what Paul also put in that letter? There's some account of building that letter. He said towards the end, and oh, by the way, prepare a bed for me, because I hope to come and see you. I think that's Paul's way of saying, what I'm telling you to do, I'm going to check up on. <laughs> Inspect what you expect. I think Paul's saying the same thing here. I expect of you as believers at Philippi, even though you're suffering, that you might have conduct which is befitting of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to, I'm going to pay attention. If I don't get to come, I know someone's going to tell me. So, by all means, draw near to God and do just that. So I think most of you know um, I hit a benchmark in December. I turned 60 years old. Um, someone said, you're old. I said, no, I got old at 55. That's when it all started to fall apart. So I'm past that already. Um, but on this 60th birthday, I received a ton of birthday cards. And I don't know what it was about this particular year, but I just felt so, I was so moved by all the notes and the cards that I received. I think, I think part of it was is because this coming summer, Lord willing, um, I'll, be, I'll have been here 30 years at Community Bible Church. So a year from now, I'll have spent most of my life at Community Bible Church as pastor, which I think is a wonderful gift from the Lord. But I received some notes from people from 25 and 30 years ago when, when I first became the pastor here. And so many of them wrote and just talked about how the Lord what the Lord did in their lives back in, in the 90s, and then others since then too. And I got to be just a small part of that, of what God was doing. And I just was overwhelmed. I, I will tell you that there's no greater gift, I think, than a church can give to their pastor and the leaders, is to be a church that seeks the Lord and is united in Jesus Christ. And I want to testify, and I want to say praise the Lord that I've got to be part of a church like that. For so many years. Like every church, every group, we have our ups and downs. Sometimes we're rough, but God is good. And I, I just feel so, so blessed. And I, I, I thank God. I think there's some Psalms that are good to look at every year. One of them is Psalm 1, and I want you to go to Psalm 1. Psalm 1. I think it is good for us to be reminded of these wonderful deposits of truth that God has given to us that should delight our souls, but also instruct us and at the same time grant important warnings to us. This psalm is like many psalms. It's going along, it's great, everything's happy, and then suddenly we turn our attention to the wicked. And I think that's necessary for us always to be mindful of that, to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. If you don't mind, Stan, I want to read this. You can follow along or you can listen. The psalmist declares, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. What a blessing then. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Now here again, this is important for us to heed these warnings and pay attention. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Listen to this wonderful truth. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Heavenly Father, please grant to those who need it today 
to note and heed even this warning within this passage. If, Lord, there is one who is ungodly here today, I pray that you'd overwhelm them with your grace, that the simple message that they are in need of a Savior and Christ alone is that Savior, may today be the day that they hear the commandment that you've given, that all men must repent and all are to trust in your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, if there is someone here who is wayward, and maybe even at this time is questioning whether or not they know you, then I pray, Lord, again, you'd visit them with your Spirit this day and either convict them of sin or righteousness if they need to repent. And please, may this be the day of salvation. If, Lord, though they need to repent because they do belong to you and need to, again, confer- commit to seeking you, then, Lord, may this be the day. Mark this day, I pray, in their life that they have determined once again to seek you with our whole heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. Lord, you have called us to be a people, a particular people, a unique people, who are not only set apart, but considered strange. And I pray, Lord, that our conduct would indeed be worthy of the gospel. That our lives would demonstrate that we recognize that your son did in fact die to pay for our sins and rose from the dead, that we might be right with you. Help us to praise you, not just as we gather, but as we go out now to be a people who share the good news that Jesus saves, Jesus saves. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.